Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our live critique. How's everyone doing this morning? Is my sound coming through okay? Hi, Rosa. Yes, I hope everyone is in good health this morning. Um, I know we're all kind of a little anxious about everything that's going on in different parts of the world. I think everyone's kind of being affected similarly. Okay, great. All right. Um, so I didn't receive any specific questions by email, but I just wanted to start off while a few people are still coming in um, with just an open Q&A. Um, now, I, I wanted to mention that I had posted the um, some of the brushes that I like kind of a download in the forum uh, for some of the oil paint brushes I use in this program while I'm editing. So um, I did put that in Dropbox and I know some of you were having trouble with downloading the file and I haven't had a chance to look into why that is, but it might be that you need to open it on your actual iPad, not on a computer, um, if you're going to be um, importing it into Procreate. So um, I'll try and look into that later this weekend and see if I can figure out why there's an issue. Um, was anyone able to successfully download it and use it in their Procreate app? Well, okay, so if you uh, want to try a little bit later, that link was posted in the forum. You should have gotten an email um, when I sent that out. Um, so does anyone have any questions before we get started? These are just general questions. Okay, Kat, you don't have Procreate, okay. Um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions about this week's lesson, this past week. Now I had sent out an email to our critique group yesterday talking about the schedule change um, and I'll announce it in our forum as well. Um, so just because of everything that's going on, I think everyone kind of feels like they want a little bit of time to catch up and I realize there is a lot of content that you have to watch and then you have to actually work on your paintings. Uh, so next weekend we are gonna skip critique and we're going to kind of push our critiques out by a week. Um, since my travel plans in May were canceled, um, we're going to uh, take a break next weekend from the live critiques, uh, and then we will pick up the following weekend, and then we will end a, a week later um, in April. So um, you guys have some time to kind of get through to the grisaille stage. That's kind of what I'm hoping is if you have that extra week, you can get your grisaille at least close to finished. You can get the first full grisaille pass. We do two uh, two grisaille passes in addition to the tonal sketch. Um, and so before we start color. And um, this week's videos are very work intensive. There's <clears throat> almost six hours of video to watch. So uh, that's another reason I am wanting to push that out a little bit just to give you guys time to watch those videos and work on your paintings. Um, in those two value passes. Um, yes, Rosa, I can tell you a little bit about uh, my training. Um, let's see, where do I begin? I was self-taught for a really long time. And that's part of the reason why I decided to offer these cor online courses because where I grew up was pretty remote. We didn't have any trained artists around. Um, oh or art classes for that matter, um, outside of what was offered at like a Michael's or a, you know, um, like a Joann's <laughs> store. So we didn't, you know, I didn't have that much. Um, so I would rent videos from the library um, and watch, you know, uh, instructional DVDs and stuff. They, they just didn't, there weren't that many. So I tried to teach myself from books, which was, is really hard. Um, and eventually, after going to a university for three years and I didn't learn how to paint at all because um, they don't really teach a lot of technique, um, it was more conceptual, um, I left and I went uh, down to Los Angeles one summer just for, it was supposed to be just like a summer uh, kind of internship program um, and 
I, so I worked at the Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art. Um, just I worked in their administration office and in exchange for classes. So, um, so I went there for about, well, I was supposed to only be there for a summer and I ended up uh, staying for a, a year. Um, and then from there, I was introduced uh, to one of my teachers who was studying with Adrian Gottlieb in his atelier. And so I, he, you used to have to submit a portfolio to get into Adrian's group so um, and have like a referral. It was kind of an application process. Um, so I got into that and I studied there for about a year. And then um, I took maybe four years and really just kind of worked on the skills I had learned. Um, but I had studied everything from a la prima, more direct approach to um, more classical methods. Um, try here, let me hold on. Rosa, you lost audio. If anyone else has lost audio, try refreshing your page. Let me type that out. Hold on. Can anyone else hear me? You have audio? Okay. Uh, thank you, Kathy. So any, if, uh, hopefully people refresh the page and they can, they can catch up. Okay. Thank you, Penny. Okay, good, good. Um, so yeah, so after that, I pretty much took some time off and really worked on, uh, I started, I began teaching actually, and, um, opened up a little studio down in Los Angeles. Um, and then I started to, uh, think about returning to school cause I didn't have, um, I finished my degree. Um, and, so I started looking at some art schools and I really didn't want to go to another place that pushed um, like conceptual modernism. I really wanted something that was more in line with what I knew I wanted to do, which was, and what I had been doing, um, which was a more classical realism. And so I found uh, Laguna College of Art and Design down in Laguna Beach. And I went there and finished my degree and opened up a studio in Orange County and ran uh, an atelier for a couple years out there. And then eventually um, I just decided I wanted to focus more on my studio work and commissions. Um, and so I left the LA area and moved into a smaller town and um, built a studio. <laughs> and so here I am now and offering online classes. Um, so that's pretty much where it comes from. I mean, I still take workshops with artists um, occasionally. Um, I feel like as an artist, your learning is never finished. Um, you always have like some area that you want to improve. Um, you know, that perfection is kind of always on the horizon. And so, you know, maybe the things I want to hone or perfect might be either in a different medium or, you know, a different technique that I'm not familiar with. Uh, there's always room for improvement. So I feel like learning is, my learning is never finished and I'm, I'm continuously always trying to learn something new um, as well. Oh, good, good. I'm glad you could hear it now. Um, so yeah, that, did that answer your question? That's a little bit of my background. Um, I, I've been teaching for, gosh, like 12 years now. <laughs> Um, a lot of time, a lot of that time I taught figure painting and figure drawing and portrait painting, classical still life, um, master copy, like just pretty much everything, site size. Um, and uh, I think what I like about offering the online classes is even though we can't all be in the same room and it has kind of a downside to that, um, I do like it because I can reach more people and the way I see it is it's kind of a resource that I wish I had when I was first starting out as a self-taught artist. Um, it was being self-taught is already a challenge, but if you have, you know, kind of some resources and a community that you can create, um, even if you do live in a remote area, it helps immensely. And the way I always like to look at training or like taking workshops or classes, you know, the amount of time it would take you to figure these things out on your own, you know, through trial and error. Um, you know, I've learned more at 
when I started my training, my formal training, within a year, I learned more than I had taught myself over the previous five years, you know, just trying to figure things out on my own. Um, so I feel like, you know, the best way to learn is by people who've gone through that and also just having a set process. Um, it's easy to break rules, but you have to kind of learn them first. And you're right, Kathy, it is a lifelong process. Um, but it's, it's really about kind of getting that structure in place so that you feel like you have that support and you have a process that you can rely on that's going to give you good, good results. You know, um, you can start to experiment with, you know, technique or, you know, developing your own personal style, um, later on. It, it's really, and it, everybody kind of has a personal style kind of built in anyway, but, um, as far as like experimentation and exploring, um, that creative side, it's much easier to do that creative side once you have the skills set under your belt. Um, and you're always going to be wanting to improve certain skills, but, you know, having those fundamentals and that, you know, process that speaks to you, um, you know, I was always drawn to the classical process. I like Alla Prima as well, and I do it a lot for fun, um, but really the, the technique of using these multiple layers and, and experimenting with how layering color works and kind of that nuance, um, it just, that's what excites me and gets me really um, enthusiastic about what I'm making. So for me, it is very much about the process too. And I love teaching. That's another passion of mine, if you guys can't tell. Um, so I really enjoy sharing that process. Um, and my training, you know, the, a lot, I get a lot of people who approach me and say, well, I, I don't know if I should go to an atelier or if I should, you know, and learn like this specific method, or if I should, you know, kind of piecemeal my education together. And, um, this is just my personal opinion from my own experience. I feel like I learned, um, the most by studying from a diverse group of artists, um, I still kind of all working in the similar vein um, of classical realism or even if it was more direct approach um, realism. There was a kind of a congruency there or a similarity between the artists, but everyone had their own unique take. And I feel like you can learn a lot more that way. And it's just like more tools in your toolbox that you can pull out uh, when you're trying to achieve a certain effect. Um, and it kind of makes you more rounded as an artist instead of going and just learning sight size and then that's all you know. Um, and then you're kind of stuck within that kind of rigid format. Um, so my suggestion is to kind of diversify and get out of your comfort zone, even if it's not something you see yourself doing. Uh, like, for example, a la prima, if it's really not your style but, uh, and it's not that exciting to you, I still recommend you practice it. And even take some workshops with artists who do a la prima painting because it will make you a better painter as a classical artist as well. Um, it will just kind of round you out further, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, I'm glad to hear that, Kathy. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy. I, I love seeing everyone have success um, in my classes and seeing the beautiful work everyone makes. Um, and this is fun, too, because... Um, everyone in this critique group is doing their own setup. Um, so we're getting a little more diversity here and that's really fun to see as well. It's not always easy to do that with like a live model because not everybody has access to a model. So, um, okay, so let's go ahead and jump into critiques. And if you guys come up with any questions, just write them down and I'll, I'll uh, open up the floor again for questions at the end. Um, so Penny, we're gonna go ahead and start with you. And it doesn't matter what stage, I'm just going to reiterate that, um, that it doesn't matter what stage you're at, um, if you're at just the line drawing this week or if you have your tonal sketch or more of a grisaille finished, um, don't worry about that. Um, you have some time to catch up and the way the class kind of operates this week is very, the new lessons this week are very like load heavy. It's a lot of work to do. Um, same thing with the previous lesson where we did the first grisaille pass. 
So just kind of focus on those two weeks. Um, and then after that, we're doing a pretty simple glaze um, to get us moving into color. And that week is less work intensive. So if you kind of need a little extra time, we're pretty fluid here. So don't stress if you're feeling like you're a little behind. Um, just send me what you can um, when we resume our lessons after next weekend. Um, okay, so I think this looks great. Now you had some questions about like how to handle that flower um, because it's a lot of information in there and you weren't sure if like adding more dark um, or how, how much information you should really be adding. Um, I think what you have here for your tonal sketch is perfect. Um, the tonal sketch, again, is really just like that first process of moving us towards tone. Um, because we, we focus so heavily on line and everything's defined by lines, but what we need to start shifting our thinking towards is thinking tonally and how value relationships work. And that's what this tonal sketch is for. So if it's uneven in the background or, you know, you're not quite sure how to handle certain um, areas, it's okay for this first initial sketch. When you go into the mixed grisaille where we're doing more opaque mixtures, you can be much more specific with your values and much more detailed. Um, again, that first value pass, you want to avoid some of the little um, uh, tiny nuance details. You don't really need to get those in. We're still thinking kind of broad in this terms of, of value shape. Um, but you can be a little bit more um, specific, um, especially because these washes um, can be hard to control, and it's much easier once you're going with opaque uh, value mixtures uh, to have that control. Okay, so um, let me just get a, a sketching. I'll just go with an ink, ink pen so I can do some drawing here. Um, okay, um, I, yeah, I think this looks really good. Um, the one thing you might want to look out for, I just kind of turned your picture into um, a black and white and then kind of warmed it up. Um, one thing you might just want to look out for when you start getting into like these shadows here and here, let me make my pen a little bigger. So when you start getting into like this shadow here, uh, if it's on a white surface, just notice how light the value actually is. Um, and you might want to lighten up that one there just a little bit. Um, you'll notice like in here, in this section right in here, how that kind of unifies as a dark gradation. There isn't as much of a segmenting here. So just as you move forward, what you have for the tonal sketch is fine. Um, so when you move into your grisaille, just start to think about a couple of these things. Um, same thing for like these areas where there's um, little highlights on the metallic surface. You'll notice that they are a darker value um, than your main highlight here. So just again, being more specific with uh, your values. I don't see anything in terms of drawing. Um, but let me help you a little bit on simplifying that flower. So I'm going to do a little paint over and just show you how I would um, simplify when you go into that first grisaille um, pass. So let me just kind of zoom in here so we can see both the flower. Let me pull this down here. Um, okay. So when you go in, what you'll do is take your darker mixed value, which would be, it's not going to look that gray. I'll just do like a dark brown about you know, a little lighter than that. Um, yeah, something like that. So it's going to be an opaque mixture. Um, and you will kind of keep your structure that you have here, but you would start with your, your dark. And you have this core shadow that kind of comes across here and then you have this lighter value that's maybe one step up but still a shadow value and this um, you might want to watch 
I'm going to be doing a video on painting translucent objects and that includes flower petals um, or like fruit like grapes um, are slightly translucent um, and we're going to talk about how what happens is um, light kind of passes through that thin um, flower petal and it's illuminating within that shadow. So what happens is we see a lot of light bouncing around in flowers and that's what can kind of throw off our value structure. And that's where this grisaille is really going to help you um, because it's going to separate those values. So for example, another good area to look at is this section right here. So um, going back to that dark value, you have your drawing here and you have those darker values kind of mapped out. So I'm just looking at these little abstract shapes. But if we start to try and separate light from shadow, notice that there's the darker section and then there's a little bit of light here and a little bit of light here, but it's actually a shadow still. It's not light mass because this is our light mass here. So it's, it, and this is light mass as well. So, and you'll notice that this is just slightly darker. Um, so that's determined, what's making that happen is it's um, the light passing through the membrane. So you want to still think of it as a shadow and simplify that grouping. Okay, and this is like how almost how you would tile it in. Of course, it would be softened out eventually. Um, and then you have the light mass, which is that value. And then you have a little bit down here. And actually, it's even a little bit darker than that. Maybe it's one step down. And then you would want a thin tile kind of between to serve as that transition uh, value. If we move over here where it's really complex, I would just simplify into a similar kind of shape so maybe go in and tile in with the next value. And then the final lighter value, which is in a few, just a few select areas here at the top. Actually, this dark value kind of comes up this way. I think what you have is two petals, so you might have to edit the drawing just a little bit here. So you have a little reflected light happening in there. Yeah, so one of the things I say, always suggest is to try and remember to squint your eyes um, especially if you find yourself getting lost in some of these details. Um, and even if your flower ends up really simplified and kind of structured like that in the beginning, that's okay because you can add more nuance in that second grisaille pass. In fact, the simpli simplification is um, kind of crucial at a stage like this because we don't want to lose that sense of structure in our painting. Um, so you might find it a lot easier. So like in here, you might have another dark value and then there's a rim light. And you can kind of see you started to indicate that there. Okay. So do you see how that simple is kind of simplifying um, gradually? So this area, oops, this area would be mostly light. It's those shadows that start to get complex because there is a lot of reflected light happening um, in these tiny little areas. And it's gonna look very abstract in the beginning. So just be okay with that. Um, even like this center part, um, try to just group it into, for example,
don't worry about like the little striations and, and lines. Just try to group it into some values and then you can go in later and get more specific and add. You could add some of these little lines, but I would actually probably wait until the second pass to do those. Of course, you would go through and simplify or kind of blend these out. But yeah, so this part, for example, in the middle, I would maybe just leave those tiny little lines um, where they kind of separate off and just remember to squint and simplify the grouping. So for example, you have a little bit of a light group coming this way. And this comes over. I'll send you a copy of this digital painting so you can kind of use it as a, as a guide. Um, even this value kind of continues around. And anytime you see an abstract shape like a, a triangle or something, use that to kind of help you stay oriented um, in the painting. And once you start filling it in with solid values, I feel like you're going to start to see that structure come together. So yeah, in the beginning, you could maybe even break this up a little bit more specific if you wanted to kind of add some variety to that shape, but I wouldn't worry too much about all the little lines. In fact, what might be useful is in the first grisaille pass, go one step darker for these light areas. Um, and the reason is, so if I just said, maybe take that down a little step, um, it won't look correct in this layer, but when you go in with your second grisaille pass, you can then go in and add the little light shapes on top and it will give the illusion of more um, depth so that would be maybe in a second pass. Does that make sense? So let me zoom out and kind of show you the, that simplification there. And I'm gonna leave this kind of abstract like this, but you would go through and kind of blend things out um, before you let the layer dry. Do you have any other questions? Um, also with your fabric over here on the right, you could get more specific with that value shift from this crease uh, once you're in that uh, opaque grisaille. Um, everything looks really good. Um, I think you're, you're ready to move on. Um, what I can do, uh, it might be kind of useful, is I'll take your photo reference and I'll also email this to you after our critique. Um, and I'll send you a posterized version. Um, there unfortunately isn't a posterized filter in uh, Procreate or else I'd show you how to do that uh, right now. But if you have like a Photoshop or anything like that, you can actually use a posterization filter or there's um, like a paint, paint filter that you can put over it. Um, and I find it helpful sometimes because it takes the values and kind of groups them, especially if you're having a hard time seeing it. Um, and I don't have a problem with using technology in that way if it helps you learn to see better. There's even actually a couple of apps on like phones that you can download. There's one um, that was made for landscape and when you take a picture it, it shows you the values of your landscape and also uh, kind of separates the values and it's a really useful tool when you're training. Um, and then eventually you might find that you don't need it. Um, but it, a lot of times you know, half of learning to paint is learning to see. Um, and we need those concepts, you know, kind of those visual aids sometimes in the beginning. So I'll, I'll send you a posterized version, um, especially for that flower, and maybe that'll help you see how you can approach it. Especially the tiling technique. I think that it, it really is crucial for learning to simplify your first layer. Um, but learning how to do that, how to simplify it in the first place is really tricky because we always tend to see the detail first. That's what our eyes tend to want to focus on. So um, I'll send you that posterized version and I'll also send you this paint over so you can kind of see um, that distinction. All right, 
Uh, any other questions? All right, well, if you think of anything, just let me know. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, should I do any adjustment with the background values? Um, are you going to just leave the background kind of black or a dark color? Because um, if you are, then you would just paint over it. Um, you know, obviously you wouldn't be painting in that cardboard texture. Just do a gradient. Um, you might find that in order to get that darkest value over here, that you'll need to mix a little bit of umber with um, ultramarine blue to get make it even darker because burnt umber isn't that dark sometimes um, so you might end up doing that just to give you a little bit more contrast especially for this um, this little um, metal cup it's going uh, the little um, dark side of it is going to be really really black um, so just make sure Okay, so, yeah, yeah, okay, so just leave it black. That's perfectly fine. Um, just make sure, what I would suggest is like right in this area over here on the right side of the metal cup, make sure it's maybe um, a couple of steps, va uh, value steps lighter than this dark here. This you just want it as dark as you can get it with that umber and uh, ultramarine blue. And that's going to give you that nice silhouette effect um, that's happening. But everything's, everything in this layer is going to get covered with an opaque, an opaque layer, essentially. So you will be kind of repainting. This first of a value sketch is just our rough guide for our first grisaille pass. All right, beautiful job. I look forward to seeing the painting in two weeks. But of course, I want to actually put this out there. Um, if you guys are feeling stuck after your first grisaille pass and you want to move on to the second one and you want feedback, just email me your images and I, I'm happy to give you help in the meantime. I just didn't want, I wanted to give everyone a little extra time to work so we won't be meeting uh, next weekend. All right, Kathy, let's go ahead and start yours. Um, so you had mentioned you weren't quite sure um, how to handle the, the, how much information to put in the wood tabletop. Um, what you did for this initial sketch is perfectly fine. Um, like I said, it's really hard to control those washes. And um, even the, yeah, like the tones on the cup, it's hard to be really, really subtle with that first tonal um, wash pass. But Again, we're just trying to shift into tones, so I think what you did here is, is just fine. You will be able to get more specific with your values uh, when you start doing your um, opaques. Um, one thing you'll just want to try to make sure of, and if let's just kind of look at the cup here and do a couple of comparisons. Um, so if we look at the value here that looks like a light, let me just do like a different brush here. So if we look at um, what's happening with the cup is there's all this reflected light kind of um, dissolving the shadow a little bit. So what you want to make sure of in your painting is that it still reads as a part of the shadow. Um, and so sometimes that might mean pushing the value a little bit darker. Um, But let's just see, let's make a value comparison. So there is that shadow section on the lower part of the cup here. It's a reflected light, technically. Um, and then let's compare that to the light mass over, well, even let's compare it to like a mid-tone, like right next to the daisy up here. So even though they look very similar in value on the cup, notice how there is a distinction between the values um, when we kind of isolate them. And even when I go towards the light a little bit more, it's even lighter. It's gradual, but it is. And then of course you have the lightest value, which is the daisy. 
So you are working in a very tight value structure. So what might be helpful for you when you start to move into those tones and let's even compare this light here on the, so there's the daisy to the handle. So the handle is actually the lightest white on the whole cup. So you're going to be working in a quite a tight value structure. So when you're mixing your values, you probably will want a few more steps in your light masses. Um, so maybe like where I maybe mixed two or three steps between the midtone and the light mass or the highlight, um, you might want a few more because you're going to be working in this tight kind of value structure. Uh, what can be helpful when you're starting to establish that is making sure you get this background value a match uh, because that's going to set, set the stage. Um, so if we just grab that background that's just adjacent to the cup, um, you can see how uh, pale that is. Um, but when compared to the handle of the cup, which is almost a pure white, that's kind of the value structure that's going to set the stage for your cup. So what I would suggest is starting with that background and then use almost your pure white for the handle on the cup. And then realize everything going down from there is like a value step down. So the next value step down would be the daisy and then adjacent to that would be um, so let me actually, let me organize this here real quick. I'm gonna, cause I'm gonna send this to you. So let's do like a, a little value scale sample. So you have, here we have the background color. Then we have the handle. Then we have the daisy. And the handle is pretty close to the flower. Um, but so let's do the daisy, which they're very similar, but the handle's just a little bit brighter. Then we have the cup body in the light mass, which is, I would say, pretty. Let's see if that daisy, you can see that dis distinction for the daisy. It's very, very close. Let me change this background color to a middle gray. That might help. Um, okay. So you can see that distinction is very, very tight. Um, but then we start going into the lower part, which is the reflected, reflected light. You can see that's very close to that background color. And then you have your core shadow. Oop, and that's almost a value match to our background. Let me go a little darker just so you can see it. So let's maybe a value five and then we have our shadow. So you can see the values are very tight in the top half. Um, and I'm just going to draw some lines for you. So this was the background. This was The handle. Um, this was the. I think that was the daisy. Oops. Here, let me. And then this was the body of the cup next to the daisy. And then we have. that part there, that there. Oh, these lines are getting confusing, <laughs> but you get the point. <laughs> um, so those last two values are the shadow for the cup. Um, so just keep that in mind. And that might be a good place to start in your painting um, in general. And then of course you have the table. So when you get to the table, don't worry about the wood texture as much. Um, just focus on the, those value groupings um, and those reflections um, in that shadow from like the oranges and stuff um, and the cast shadows of course. 
then in the second grisaille layer, you would go in and indicate some of the wood grain. But you don't have to do that in the first one. Just kind of squint your eyes and look for that generalized value. Does that make sense? So you can see with this how subtle and close these values are at the top um, in that cup. There's no way you would be able to achieve that with this tonal wash. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, you'll be able to get that more when you move into the um, full closed grisaille. Um, let's see. So your cup and like the flower have the lightest lights. Um, your table is the darkest dark, so those might be the two places to start um, when you move into your grisaille, apart from this background. I would definitely get this background in. Um, and then you can go in to the oranges after, because I think it'll be judging those values will be a lot easier. Yeah, so for the table, um, like, I would say the value is probably close to that. Yeah, so, so you would go in and, like what you indicated here already, like these little value shapes, you can put those in, but you don't need to worry about it if you wanted to just kind of generalize that whole shadow um, or value of the, t the table. If anything, I think, um, you're underpainting. This tonal sketch is maybe a little light in this table, so just keep that in mind when you start putting it down. You might end up going quite a bit darker. Um, you want to make sure you're comparing that kind of average value. Let me go back to my... flat brush here. So if we take an average value for the table, you have that and then you have like, well obviously you have the real dark dark at the bottom, but then you have like maybe that value. And if we take those and compare them to the cup, you can see that the darkest value on the cup here is a, a the, pretty close to the lighter value of the um, table. All right, um, but everything else looks good. The drawing looks good. Um, there is one thing I think it's just kind of unclear what's happening. See how you have like this corner right here. Let me grab a pen. So you have this corner right here. Um, I kind of feel like we need an indication of the corner here instead of having this line continue. Uh, it's a minor thing, but I would just kind of continue that line across and just indicate it and then get rid of that at the bottom. It's really, really minor, but I do feel like this kind of wants to shoot us off the page a little bit. Um, and this will probably end up getting played down so much in the painting that it's almost ne uh, negligible, but you don't um, want it to kind of pull our eye off um, so early on. Yep, that looks pretty good. I wouldn't suggest anything else. Do you have any questions? So I'll send you this as well. And my suggestion for your flower is very similar. Just squint your eyes and I will send you kind of a posterized version of your um, reference as well. So that way you can kind of see that abstraction if you're struggling with that. All right, good job. I look forward to seeing your painting in two weeks. <clears throat> All right, Angela, I don't know if you're, I saw you in here earlier. <clears throat> so you, um, Got all of your arrangement. I really like what you did with the the cookie. I think that feels much better than the, the flower here um, with the kind of bite out of it. Kind of tells a little bit more of a narrative. Oh, hi, there you are. Um, your drawing looks good. Um, I don't really have much suggestion other than start to work on that tonal 
sketch, um, one of the areas that might help, obviously put in that dark background first. Um, that's going to really set the stage having this darkest black and you might find that you need to mix a little bit of umber with ultramarine blue to make that umber even darker. Um, and then I would start with the white um, of the um, teapot here. Um, when you start going in to like these details, like because you have all this kind of scalloped um, edge, I would simplify it for this first half, um, kind of the way I did in the jug that had all of those ripples um, and kind of textures in it. I simplified it for that first layer um, where I would start to maybe make a distinction is with this first value here. So, um, so like in this one here, you could start to separate the value structure. Um, maybe you could indicate a little line for this one, um, but I wouldn't worry about the subtlety in these. And one thing that will help too when you're doing your initial um, tone sketch is to take some pure white. Obviously you're not mixing values just yet, um, but take some white and lay it on a little bit heavier where those highlights are because that's going to give you a good idea of how much light to kind of spread out for the rest um, of the teapot. Whenever you're painting a white object, um, our tendency and our temptation is to go really, really light all over, but we have to remember that this pure white here, or the highlight is the only pure white in the painting, um, even though you're painting a white object. So those values are going to be very tight across that light mass of the form. Um, let's see. Same goes for the fabric here, like comparing the tone of the fabric to the, the teapot. Um, compare those values. And yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, do you have any questions before you move into the tonal sketch? And once you get the tonal sketch done, Angela, go ahead and email me a picture if you want some feedback before you moved into the opaque grisaille. And the tonal sketch, like I said, doesn't need to be that detailed. It's mostly like thinking about the major value masses for the painting. So that real dark background and the white foreground um, are pretty much uh, the important ones. Um, one, I don't know what, are you painting this from life, Angela? Or are you working from this photo? I'm asking because I, um, oh, you're gonna be painting from life, okay. I don't know if your perspective when you're sitting there at your easel looking at your still life is slightly different. Um, so just take a look at this area. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Um, okay, so I would just say to, let me get a dark pen here. Maybe I'll draw it in a different color. So I just noticed something with the spout here. It's a little bit, your ellipse is a little bit too open, so it's going to be a little bit more closed. So just keep that in mind. So I'm just looking at other parts here. Um, the cookies look good. Now in the picture, this um, teacup feels a little bit like more tilted, but um, I think the way you have it in your still life is, is fine. It doesn't um, need to be kind of skewed like that. That could be just due to camera distortion. Um, I think the handle might've gotten a little tall. Let me just draw a horizontal line here.
so you can see where that sits. Um, Hold on, let me move this. I accidentally grabbed that. There we go. Um, so it looks like yours is sitting a little high on the cup. So just use like a horizontal line. You can just bring it down a little bit. I think if you even just rounded this off a little bit, it would um, do the trick. Your plate looks good. Yeah, everything else looks pretty good to me. Um, so I yeah, just go ahead and move on into your tonal painting and send me an update whenever you have that ready. Uh, do you have any other questions? <clears throat> All righty, good job. All right, Colin, are you in here? I don't remember if I saw you in here earlier. I might have missed it. Um, so you had sent in two different stages. So I just wanted to kind of go over because I think you had some questions. Um, and I know I had answered you, but I'm just going to answer for the group because you have... Oh, there you are. Hi. Um, so you had some questions about kind of this texture and how to handle, like, in this stage here, how much detail is important um, for getting, you know, how much nuance do we really need? Um, and what you have here for your initial tonal sketch um, works just fine. My only um, other suggestion would be to look at like this value, for example, here. Um, you can see it's quite a bit darker. Um, actually, let me take your photo reference here and let's just turn it um, into black and white. So we can make those value comparisons. Um, so what I probably would have done is added a, an additional wash to this section um, right in here. Um, but pretty much everything else, maybe a little bit of a scumble of white over here. Um, the Madonna figure here is the lightest area in the whole painting apart from the edge of the book here. So those will be your brightest values. So keep that in mind as you move uh, forward into your second um, grisaille pass. You will be bringing this grisaille into an almost completely finished state. If not, it should look like a finished painting um, because when then we start going into color and glazing. And for something like your subject matter, um, those glazes will probably be um, pretty much like a final layer for like the fabric for example if you get the fabric pretty much like it looks like a, the the finished black and white version of what the painting will look like in the end then all you'll have to do is glaze a little bit of a rich red um, over that fabric and it will pretty much be done except for you know scumbling in a few um, light areas so really work on bringing more resolve to um, your in your second grisaille pass. Um, treat it like you're doing a finished painting in color, but you're doing it in um, gray. Um, okay, so that would include getting more detailed with your Madonna, because that seems like the one of the main focal points for the painting. Um, and I think this value here probably could go a little bit darker. Um, you can see there's this really nice gradation from like this this gray. Let me grab a different brush here. So you have this this gray um, at the top, and then it goes down into like that value, and then you have this lightest value. So it, it's one of the areas of high contrast. Um, 
The darkest area is right here. So that for that area, you're probably going to want to mix a little ultramarine blue with your umber to make sure you get that rich black um, by comparison. Um, let's see. So yeah, your goal in the end is to have this grisaille look more like a, a finished painting. That includes your edges that you want. So maybe look at where you can soften some of the edges for your fabric. Um, look at this nice gradation you have across the fabric. So if we take like, I know there's a lot of information in that crushed velvet. Um, so take averages. So like that average value apart from the highlights. Um, and then let's take an average value from the top here. So you need to create that gradient kind of going from the bottom left to the upper right in that fabric in the background. Uh, right now you can see that this and this value look very similar. So we want to make sure we get that nice kind of fall off of light. Um, I think it helps to vignette the, the um, subject matter as well. And getting that nice dark contrast behind the scale is going to be key for getting that focal point um, there as well. Uh, what is in the scale here on the left? I'm just curious. I can't quite tell. That area right there. What is that in the scale? I'm just curious. It's for my own curiosity. I think you have a really interesting like combination of objects and a narrative happening here. Um, one thing you might also consider um, just watching out for is whenever you have a line, um, let me bring this up here. Whenever you have a line going right to the corner of your canvas, um, oh, it's a white feather, okay. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so one of the things, just watch out for that line leading us right to that corner. You might consider either moving the fabric here or dropping it lower. I think maybe even dropping it lower might work. Um, it is very deep concept because I can see, see that the other one looks like a, is that a thimble on the right side of the scale? I'd love to actually hear about some of your uh, concept here. Uh, if you write about it in the forum, you kind of t share a little bit. I'd love to, oh, it's a ring, okay. I'll try and do a tutorial sometime um, uh, for free on like my YouTube or something on using some of the tools here. And I, it is a really useful tool. I use it quite a lot um, when I'm planting paintings and stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, my suggestion, Colin, is to maybe drop that. It doesn't need to be a big change, but just don't have it go straight to that corner. Um, and another way to kind of pull the eye away from that a little bit is um, to soften the edge of that fabric as it reaches that corner, almost like a vignette, just have it fade off. And you can do that by also making this white go a little bit darker, um, almost the way it does here on the right side. Have it go a little bit darker as it gets off, um, off canvas to the left, and that will help to, again, vignette the, the um, painting a little bit. So I can show you what that would almost look like. Here, let me get a different brush. So if we took this and we moved it down, And then we took maybe a darker value and just just vignetted as it moved up into that corner. 
um, you can see how it no longer pulls the eye into that area. And the same goes for when we you get up into this upper right corner, going in a little bit darker is going to help as well. Um, let's see. The bottle here um, is casting a shadow. So you want to, st I know you have like a pattern um, on the cover of this book. You can start to paint that in, but just make it very abstract. Yes, yeah. And that'll become more apparent in this week's lessons, Colin. You'll see, because I go in and I actually detail the grisaille. And it's a long week <laughs> because detailing takes a lot of time. But I pretty much bring that almost to a finish. Um, so keep that, just keep that in mind. Um, so you can go in, you're already kind of ahead, but you can really take your time and finesse um, some of these values and start to get like uh, more definition in like the Madonna's face um, and some of that abstracting on the, um, like the pattern on the book and like more detail in the bottle and, and that sort of thing. Uh, do you have any questions? Um, I think so. I think, uh, the value, like you mean in your mixed values, it looked pretty good. Um, but I think you might find yourself wanting to mix more, um, of a light value range, especially for when you get into the Madonna here or some of this foreground where it's a little bit lighter. Um, you'll find yourself wanting maybe a few more values. So you have a little more control. Um, one thing that's going to help is Establishing that lightest light, kind of starting off, pure white on the edge of the book here and find the areas of pure white on the Madonna. And then from there, it'll kind of give you that, that um, value structure because you already have kind of your darkest, well, you have a pretty dark value here. This should be your darkest dark though on the um, top of the box, this little shape right here. So maybe establish that and then establish your lightest light and then that will give you that value key um, to, that you're gonna be working in. Yeah, you might want a little bit more range um, for the fabric too. So maybe you, if you find yourself like not having the right value, just take the two piles, like let's say between your mid-tone and your uh, next step, and you let's say you keep finding yourself needing to mix one with your brush, just take your palette knife and take half of each of those piles and mix them together. That's one of the easiest ways to do it. So, And sometimes you don't know what you're gonna need exactly until you're in the middle of painting and you're finding, oh, I really need more of this value because you know, it's more in more areas than I realized um, and I didn't mix it then just mix it right then and there and you'll have a pile to, to move forward with. All right, good job. This looks really nice. I look forward to seeing it. And I would love to hear about it if you're willing to share. Um, okay, so that concludes our critiques. Oh yeah, canvas versus board. Um, so what's, what's your question about that? Um, well, I can just kind of, while you're writing out your question, I can kind of talk about the distinction. So um, when I create the supply list, um, I usually provide like a, an option for like a linen or a canvas um, on panel, or you can just get like a gesso panel um, or an oil prime panel. Um, typically working on a panel that's just primed directly 
um, like a panel board or if it's gesso or if it's oil primer. Um, typically those are much smoother and you can achieve more detail on that kind of surface. You can achieve a lot of detail on a linen, um, especially if it's like triple primed or quadruple primed linen, um, where it's actually very, very smooth as well. Um, there's different grades of linen and canvas, just like there's different grades of, um, of uh, like primers. Like you might find some primers are really rough and textured. Um, so I tend to prefer a smoother surface. That's just my preference. Um, when creating sharp edges, working on panel is easier. Um, if, if you feel like you need a lot of fine detail, you have a lot of fine lines that you're trying to paint. Um, if you have a really like tight amount of detail, it's much easier to do that on panel. If you're wanting a more soft effect, and your painting is really, really like soft everywhere and you're a beginner, working on canvas is easier because blending out on canvas is just easier in general. Um, also, if you like to see painterly texture, it tends to show up better on panel than it does on canvas because the weave of the canvas tends to soak up and absorb brushwork unless you're painting extra, extra thick. So I tend to like I have a tendency to paint in these, you know, more subtle, thin layers. So working on panel just serves my painting style better. Um, your last question for, yes, for portraits, I prefer board. Um, and I, I, that's pretty much what I work on now. I used to work on fine linen. But I really fi I find that the direct primed panels are the best. Um, so I use an oil primer and I prefer that just because it's not as absorbent. Um, if you work on direct gesso, it's sometimes like painting on top of chalk. It just like soaks up the oil and um, I just don't like the feeling of that. Um, but one exception to that is the ampersand gesso boards. I actually really like those. Um, they don't feel like working on gesso, but those are an acrylic gesso. Um, sometimes I prepare my own panels and sometimes uh, I, you know, so I'll prepare them with my own primer. Um, and sometimes I just buy them. It depends on the size. <laughs> if I, I usually, when, if it's, if I'm working larger, I tend to prime my own. Um, if it's smaller, I just order it because it's it's a lot of work to prepare your surfaces. Let me catch up on a couple of questions here. Um, Rosa, you asked, what brand of burnt umber do I prefer? Lately, I've been using the Gamblin uh, burnt umber. There is a big difference between certain brands. You might, like, I, I think I was using like an M Gram brand once and the umber was very pale. It doesn't quite get nearly as dark as you need. Um, some are really warm and red. Some are more like, you know, earthy and, and um, a little cooler. You could even use raw umber if you prefer that to burnt umber. Um, it just happens to be what I use. Some artists don't like to use umbers because they're very absorbent um, and they tend to sink in. You guys might have noticed that. Um, like your painting kind of goes matte and dries a little lighter. Um, and that bothers some artists, but I, you know, for me, the burnt umber is just that preliminary stage and I just want it to dry quick. And umber is one of the fastest drying pigments there is. So, um, it tends to set up and, and cure really well. And whenever you're using a multiple layer technique, you want that underpainting to be really dry before you start glazing and adding color and, and stuff, just because we want to follow that fat over lean. And we also want to prevent any wrinkling or um, cracking. And if you guys look in that uh, handout I made for mediums, um, that kind of goes over all the mediums I mentioned, I do have a little paragraph above about what creates wrinkling and cracking in a painting. Um, so that way you can um, keep that in mind as you work. Um, so you, uh, Rosa, you had another question. So you're working on the same still life as I am. Can you use ultramarine blue for the blacks? You can, but I would suggest mixing a little bit of umber into it so it doesn't feel so 
different from the umber. And you asked if have I used another color for grisaille. Uh, yes, you can use um, like a raw umber, which has more of like a greenish quality. Um, I've seen some, <coughs> excuse me, uh, some artists use a green umber. Um, some people like to use ivory or Mars black. I don't like using blacks because they take forever to dry. Um, ivory black will stay wet for a really long time, just like titanium white does. Um, it takes almost twice to three times as long to cure, even with mixing mediums in there to help speed up the drying. So um, I just tend to avoid them just because they take a long time. But also I find that the brown lends itself to glazing color a little better than going with like a cold black. Um, and you'll see what I mean when we start moving into color, even that umber brown where it looks really, really red, um, it starts to take on a different quality when we start introducing color. So um, just keep that in mind. Whatever you have your underpainting, it's going to influence what you put in your um, upper layers. So some I know some artists who use burnt sienna as an underpainting, but to me that is too red. Um, it really throws off your perception of uh, any color you put down is going to feel cool, even like a yellow ochre will feel kind of cool and green compared to that burnt sienna. So um, I try to pick something as close to neutral, maybe slightly on the warmer side, but more neutral um, as possible. Thank you, Colin. Yes, uh, I, this still life is not like your typical still life, Colin. So I, I really wanted to pay. I love telling narrative uh, through still life. I think it's a really cool way to you know, expand on telling a story um, through symbolism. So I, I really was curious about um, what the meaning is behind your painting there. All right, so any other last minute questions before we wrap up? All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and uh, end our session. Um, oh, wait. Oh, yep. Yeah. You're very welcome, Ludmilla. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Um, okay, so next week we will not be having critiques. Just take the weekend and use it to work on your painting. Of course, you'll have a new lesson next week, um, but we will uh, skip our critiques if you guys do have questions, you can always post in the forum and I will answer you as quickly as I can. Um, today's lessons, you have the first three videos that have been released. Um, they're about an hour each. And then either tomorrow or Monday, I will release the other four video or three videos. Um, there's quite a lot to watch this week. So um, uh, we I broke them up into a kind of hour segments or so about six hours of, of video. <laughs> so um, grab your coffee and sit back and watch and enjoy. All right, thank you guys, and I'll see you in two weeks. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Take care.